Good morning. I'm Henry Bradardi. And before I welcome Michael Still to officially open the forum, I'd like to welcome all of you for coming along. This is our 20th forum on improving mental health for older people in Southeast Sydney. It's a great privilege to be able to do this, and we really love doing it. And usually we do it at South Sydney Juniors Leagues Club. But this year and last year, sadly, because of COVID, we've been unable to. Michael Still has been an investment banker for over 30 years in corporate finance, equity investment, and infrastructure, both in Australia and around the world. He's been heavily involved in health and medical research, especially in New South Wales. He's been chair of the Southeastern Sydney Local Health District for the past five years, is a board member for the Cancer Institute of New South Wales, a council member for SPHERE, which is the Sydney Partnership for Health Education Research and Enterprise, and the director of the Mind Gardens Neurosciences Network. And if that's not enough, he's also served a couple of terms on New South Wales Government Medical Services Seed Fund and the Minister for Health's Advisory Council. And I'm sure he's needed a lot of advice in the last two years. Uh, Michael holds a Master's in Business Administration from Macquarie Graduate School of Management. Michael Still. Thank you, Henry, and a very good morning to everybody. Let us begin this morning by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the various lands on which we are working and attending from today, and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people participating in this forum. Some of you will be on Bidjigal land, some of you on Durrawal land. I'm on Gadigal land. I'm speaking to you from the 1887 boardroom of Sydney Hospital, where patients suffering from the Spanish flu were treated in 1919. Over 25% of the Sydney population contracted the so-called Spanish flu, and we are reminded of those poor people today. And so we acknowledge and pay our respects well as past and present, as well as the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people participating in this forum, and thank them for their stewardship of this wonderful country over 40,000 years. Also today, we recognise those with lived experience of mental health conditions. We acknowledge that we can only provide quality care through valuing, respecting and drawing upon the lived experience and expert knowledge of consumers, their families, their carers and friends, staff and local communities. COVID-19 and its effects and consequences on us has been at the centre of our lives for nearly two years now. And what a two years that has been. So I thought that you might all be interested in knowing a little bit of what your health service has been up to in that time. I wonder, could we start with some slides? We have treated over 7,000 cases on the next slide, if we may. Over 4,000 of which were treated in their homes with the help of new communication technologies and hundreds of nurses and doctors monitoring by phone, video and personal devices. Fortunately, and often because of the tremendous qualities of our community GPs, only 750 COVID patients have been hospitalized. Over half of those were in fact from other areas. Next slide, if we may. Two and a half million tests were performed over 26 testing sites. 150,000 vac vaccinations were given by hospitals in the district. And with the help of GPs and other clinics, over 80% of residents over 16 have now been fully vaccinated. This is also a tribute to you, the community, for your wise and sensible approach to protecting our fellow community members, as well as yourselves. If we could go forward two slides. To support our, uh, our people getting on in years, the district developed what we call the RACER team, Rapid Aged Care Engagement and Response Teams. These have been wonderfully successful. In 2020 and 2021, 
over 100 aged care facilities were visited. And I must say that the care and concern offered by our teams went a long way to making sure that the outbreaks of COVID in our districts were very, very low indeed. If we could just dismiss the slides. Thank you. When I was last with you, which as Henry says was two years ago now, we talked about the wonderful new hospitals being built at Randwick, St George and Sutherland. These massive projects are either well underway or nearly finished. What will begin construction soon are two buildings on the Randwick Health and Innovation Precinct, which will become part of changing the way health is delivered, not just in our district, but across Australia, and they will also have global impact. One is a large research building connected to both the University and the Prince of Wales hospitals. It will house world-class researchers working real time with patients in hospitals on the most difficult problems in health and well-being, and of course, in mental health. The other is the Children's Comprehensive Cancer Centre, where world-renowned researchers will find cures for cancers in young people. And as we know, cancer in very young people is the most upsetting thing. These two facilities will be Australian and world leading contributors to the general improvement of healthcare. I started by recognizing those who suffered from mental health conditions and a few more words on this subject might be of interest. Our hospital's mental health people have not been surprised at the number of our people suffering increased stress, lostness, sense of isolation and anxiety, and sometimes just lingering fear. These people come to your health district for help and they are very welcome to do so. Even some of our own clinicians have admitted to their own difficulties. Many young people are having significant trouble without their social activities and being able to work and school together. I'm going to put myself in that category as well. One of our leading psychiatrists asked me only a week ago how I was going. And I said, I'm finding it very grinding. I'm tired. It's a light level of distress or stress underlying all that we do. And I'm finding that in a lot of our people. And the psychiatrist said to me, well, it's great that you say so. That's the first step, but just join the hundreds of us who are also in that boat. So I was very pleased that I was not an outlier. Our webinar today is about what is important in our lives, connection, people, community. We're all learning almost anew that looking after our mental health as we grow older is vital to our ability to function, to our happiness and to our well-being, not just for ourselves, but for our families and our community. And today we will learn more about just how to do that. Over the last 18 months, I've learned that even though I'm more than fully occupied in my roles, these underlying stresses and anxieties that we all feel from restrictions, hearing the news at night, carrying on about the numbers of COVID cases and catastrophizing every piece of COVID news globally can put us off our game, as it were. And we all have a job, therefore, to reassure our friends, reassure our neighbours and family that all will be well. I too must look after my mental health, and I hope that today will help you look after yours. You haven't, however, joined this webinar to listen to me. There are very exciting speakers to come, and I'm truly looking forward to hearing I'm very pleased to open this morning's proceedings, and I hope that you will gain much from today's presentations. And again, I thank Henry and the entire support team for such a wonderful public engagement. And I say good morning and take good care of yourselves. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, um, we're really privileged that uh, you do give us the time each year to open our forum, and I hope we see you again next year. Our next speaker 
is Dr. Suraj Samtani. Uh, Suraj came to work with me um, about two years ago. And he's been a, a wonderful researcher and colleague. He is a researcher at the Center for Healthy Brain Aging, or CHIBA, at UNSW. Uh, CHIBA is a partner in organizing this forum with the Older People's Mental Health Service at Prince of Wales Hospital. Suresh is also a clinical psychologist, and he's had several years of experience in the assessment and treatment of psychological difficulties experienced by older adults. Now, Suresh is the perfect person to give you the next presentation because his research looks at how social connections help us to maintain, maintain our cognitive health and our mental health. So I, um, uh, Dr. Santani's talk will focus on social connectedness for maintaining mental health. The talk will explore the latest science and discuss if we need a certain type or a certain amount of social connection to protect us against anxiety and depression. Dr. Suresh Santani, thank you. Thank you, Henry, for that introduction. And welcome everyone to the Mental Health Forum. As Henry mentioned today, I'll be talking to you about the importance of social connectedness for mental health. So I want to start us off with a little exercise I want you just for 10 seconds to close your eyes and think about the person that you feel most connected to. Let's do that together now. Just close your eyes and visualize the person you feel most connected to. I'll ask you to open your eyes again. So thinking about this person, how did that make you feel? Did you feel a sense of lightness or warmth or happiness in your body? Did you feel a change in your mood? It's really important to think about how important social connections are for our well-being. And I'm going to start us off with a story from one of my clients in the clinic. We'll call her Maria, although that's not her real name and this is not her photo for privacy reasons, but I'll give you a snapshot of what was going on for her. So she had retired from work and was starting to feel quite low, starting to feel like she couldn't interact with her friends, had started withdrawing from social interactions and declining invitations. She was married, but she found herself quite irritable at home and not enjoying the things that they used to do before. And she was also starting to forget things and was worried about losing her memory. That's what was happening when she first came to me. I want you to keep Maria's story in your mind because we're going to come back to her after we talk about the importance of social connections for mental health. Unfortunately, over the last couple of years, we have been told to social distance from those closest to us. But it's important to remember that physical distancing is not the same as social distancing. In fact, we think they should have called it physical distancing so that people didn't feel that they had to socially distance themselves from those they cared about. But I'm not going to talk today about COVID and how to cope with that. Professor Henry Bradati, who just introduced me, We'll be speaking to you later today about how to cope with the stressors that COVID has brought into our life. But 
But it is important to remember that there are mental health issues which are common in the population. And how common are they for people in the later stages of adulthood? Well, we know that about one in 10 adults over 65 experience some sort of mental health difficulty, whether it's anxiety or depression or something else. But I would like to point out that this rate is actually lower than in other age groups. And that's because as we get older, we tend to focus more on positive relationships and choose positive feelings and experiences. That's our superpower as we get older. And so the rates of mental health issues are actually lower in older adults. So the golden question is, do social connections help us to maintain mental health? And the answer to that is yes, of course they do. But then we need to know, well, what kind of social interaction should I be doing? And just how much do I need to stay happy and healthy? Well, we know that people who at the bare minimum interact at least once a month with friends do better than those who interact less often. And having family support, especially in midlife, is quite important for mental health. It's not about how many people we have in our social network. For some people, that might be lots of people. For others, it might be a few key people that they feel close to. What is important, though, is having someone that we can confide in, having someone that we can open our heart to and talk about how we've been feeling. Because from our research and from other studies done to date, this factor of having someone to confide in is the one that protects us against depression and anxiety. But right now, maybe we've been through several months where we haven't seen people in person or we're just starting to, or we might have friends or family who are overseas. So, well, our virtual connections good enough. Is that video call enough for us? Well, we know that it does help. In fact, having that video call or even a phone call once a month or more can help us feel less lonely. But obviously it's not a replacement for face-to-face -face interactions, although it does help. So why do social connections make us feel happy? Well, we think there are two reasons. And these are called bridging and bonding. So think of bridging as our not so close friends and acquaintances that we interact with and having those weak ties or acquaintances helps us to stay physically active and mentally active. It might be through doing um, activities in groups like an exercise class or playing cards or bingo or just joining a local walking group. This stimulates our brain and that stimulation helps our brain to stay healthy but also lifts our mood. The other way that social connections help us is through bonding. And by bonding, we mean the close relationships that we have. It might be with a partner, a, a sibling, or close friends, or other people in our lives. So these are people that we can open our hearts to confide in. And what that does for us, the science tells us that when there are negative events in our life, if we can talk to someone about it, it reduces the impact of that negative event on our stress levels. And so physiologically, we actually see people who have someone close to them that they can talk to, their stress levels are much lower, even in the same situation compared to others.
So that brings us to our next question. Well, we know that interacting at least once a month, seeing friends, having close relationships are important, but how do we maintain those relationships? I want to tell you about John Gottman's lab here because John Gottman did probably the most famous studies in this area. He set up a house, but it was actually a laboratory. So he got couples to come in and stay in this lounge, in this house for a week and bring all of their belongings with them. And they would live their normal life, have breakfast, read the news, so on and so forth. And he had video cameras in the living room to record their conversations with each other and then coded these conversations. And they actually followed people up to 30 years to find out whether these people stayed together and stayed happy. And it's incredible that they were able to predict with 90% accuracy who stayed happy and who stayed together 30 years later. And what they found was this. It's important to have positive comments. So that is giving positive words of appreciation, those thank yous for the little things every day, like thank you for doing the dishes or thank you for coming for a walk with me. It means a lot to me. And the second thing was the shared attention that we have with others. So this is, for example, if some, you're walking past someone's garden and your partner says, oh, look at that house, isn't it beautiful? It's not about the house. It's about looking at the same thing at the same time. Shows your family or friend that you actually care about them and that you're not ignoring them. So you might comment back and say, yeah, it's such a beautiful house. I love that door and their garden looks amazing. The third thing that they found was important was using humor. Sometimes you might have a tricky conversation to have with someone and using humor there to diffuse the situation and show the person that you care is really important. And the final thing was repair. So if you feel like you've done something that's upset the other person, it's important to apologize rather than let the situation build up. But if you're the one receiving the apology, it's equally important to accept the apology and not say things like, well, that's fine, but you also did this last week and that the other week and bring out a whole FBI dossier of all the things they've done that's annoyed you. It's easier to do that, but it's important to actually accept the apology when they give it to you. So my message is simple. Be kind to yourself because our mind is like a light bulb, right? The way we feel towards ourselves is the way we feel towards others. So if I'm feeling angry or upset with myself, that's the way I'm going to feel towards others as well. The light doesn't have a direction. It just goes out in every direction. So what happened to Maria? Well, we worked on the things that we've been talking about today. So she focused on the things that made her happy first. So this was doing photography. She dug out her camera from her closet after several years because she had an interest in historic houses and gardens. She joined a local photography club and she went around to different houses in the area and took photos and joined causes that mattered to her. So she did a 24 hour walk raising funds for cancer. And she started taking up invites with her friends. And she started to plan a long-awaited trip with her husband. This was to drive all the way from Melbourne to Perth. And what she found was over time, her mood actually improved. And she found purpose and happiness through herself and through her relationships. So my message to you is this. Do something that makes you happy 
and be positive towards yourself and towards others and do something that matters to you, a cause that matters to you. It's that combination of purpose and happiness which will make you feel happy. So do you want to hear a little bit more about the kind of work that we're doing? What you can do is send an email to s.dean, D-E-A-N, at unsw.edu.au to sign up and hear more about brain health. Thank you very much. Thank you, Suresh. That was a wonderful talk. It was very clear, very engaging, and had humor, had it all, and a very clear message for all of us. So uh, we really thank you for that, uh, for that presentation. I will move on to our next speaker, who is Dr. Stephanie Ward. And I, I met Stephanie probably about three, four years ago, maybe, maybe a bit longer. And she was working at Monash. And we are very lucky that she moved to Sydney. And she's been a breath of red hair for us in Sydney. So as you'll see, Stephanie is a senior research fellow at Chiba, the Centre for Healthy Brain Aging and the geriatrician at Prince of Wales Hospital in the Cognitive Disorders Clinic. Uh, she does outreach to local aged care facilities. And Stephanie was one of two geriatricians on screen on both series of the ABC TV show, Old People's Home for Four-Year-Olds. I hope you saw it. Now, this series won an Emmy Award. And Stephanie is the only clinician or researcher I know who has won an Emmy. Well, not her by herself, but with the whole group. So uh, Stephanie Ward, over to you. Thank you so much, Henry, for that lovely introduction. Um, and I've got some slides to share. I think they'll come up soon, but I'm a geriatrician. So that means I'm a specialist doctor for older adults and um, Oh, actually, I think we're just going to share a little video from series two of the show first, and then I'll, I'll have my slides up. So I'll hand over to the video. Who's your best friend? You're one of my best friends, and my other best friends are my daughter, my brother, and my sister. How about... I have four good friends. At first, you had three good friends, well... until there came the day you came and met me, and then... Now you have four best best friends. Good of you. Why are friends are important? Friends are important because they're there when you need them. And friends are good for companionship. I have my, all my fa family on my iPad. Well, that's good. Cause, yeah. Because then you can keep in touch with them, pictures. Yeah, I have pictures of my iPad. What's more, more important, having lots and lots of friends or having a few good close friends? I just think that it's a good idea to have few close friends and then Me we too. can talk to them deeply. Is that what you think too? Yeah. Because like, if we have lots of friends, they will just like say stuff at the same time. Yeah. So I think it would just be good to have a few friends. What's more important, having lots and lots of friends or having a few very close friends? Um, a lot of friends. A lot of friends. But not, not too much to me because I'm everybody's friend and everybody's my friend. Ava, why do you think having good friends is important? Because they'll need help. Yeah. And if they're on fire, the fire truck will come. Yeah, yeah, but that's good too. And yeah. if they're stuck, mm. they'll come help it. That's what good friends are for, you there? Yeah. Why do you think friends are important, Arthur? Because if we forget them on a plane. Yeah? What's three things that you look forward in the that they know my name, one. Two, that they have the same interests as I do. Thirdly, that they are able to share with me 
what sort of thing do you look for in a friend? They, um, what? That they know my joy, that they know my name, and that they know what stuff I like. Thanks so much for sharing the video. And we've just got some slides to share now, so I'll just wait for them to come up. Okay. So I'm a geriatrician, I'm a specialist doctor for older people. And one of the really rewarding aspects of being a geriatrician is that we try and look after the whole person. And so when I look after older people, often I'm trying to manage lots of different health issues like cardiovascular diseases, musculoskeletal problems like arthritis and pain, changes in hearing and vision, changes in memory and thinking and dementia, physical frailty and disability. And what I've learned over the years is that all of these health conditions actually have a bi-directional relationship with both social isolation and that sense of loneliness. And they have a big impact on our sense of purpose and our ability to connect with others. And this year, or the last couple of years, I think we've all, all learned just how pernicious not being able to connect with others can be. In fact, there's research now that suggests that the sensation of loneliness is equal to smoking with respect to adverse outcomes on health. And so while I love working in geriatric medicine and I love the fact that I get to work with so many other great health professionals, including old age psychiatrists, physiotherapists, nurses, et cetera, the whole team. What I've also come to appreciate is that there's a lot of factors outside that clinical model of care that have huge impact on our well-being: The social health factors, loneliness, our economy, the way our society is structured. There's a lot of things that I can't fix as a doctor or even my clinical team can't fix. But it also lends itself to some really exciting possibilities in terms of improving our health and improving our well-being by looking at those social factors. When it comes to older people in Australia, we know that around 10% of older people, just around 200,000, live in aged care homes. Over 1.5 million people aged over 65 live alone in the community. There's been an increase in perhaps um, single generation living scenarios such as retirement village um, setups. And overall, I think we're aware of the fact that society and lives have changed and there's, we, don't, we no longer live in multi-generational homes. There's been overall a bit of a loss of village, not for everybody, but for a lot of the population. With respect to people who live in aged care facilities, 40% have no visitor in a single year. And that's a year without a pandemic. This year's made things a lot harder. Over 50% report anxiety or depression symptoms and, 20, and many can spend up to 20 hours a day in their own room. So can intergenerational contact be a way to improve social connection, to improve purpose and to improve wellbeing for older people? To generational contact, it refers to the purposeful bringing together of different generations to benefit everybody. There's a really great research group in Australia at Griffith University led by um, Annika Fitzgerald, the Intergenerational Care Project, and have done a number of publications. I really like the way they make us think about different ways and levels of engagement. And they've got a great framework suggesting that, you know, intergenerational contact can be at a very low level, two generations in the same room, or perhaps one generation performing to another. But gradually, if we have more integrated work together, leading up to that higher level of four where a learning environment is actually shared by both generations, meeting the learning goals of both 
the generations. That's the probably the highest level of interaction and probably where the benefits flow from. How does it exist? Well, intergenerational contact outside of the family type of intergenerational contact exists in, in lots of different forms. It might be as simple as a local childcare group or preschool group or school organising a visit to a local aged care facility. It might be once a week, it might be once a year. There've been some great work with Playgroup Australia in terms of setting up playgroups that take place in aged care facilities with some beautiful results. There might be that more purposeful building of older and um, accommodation for older and younger people or co-located aged care facilities and childcare facilities. And there can be dedicated programs that integrate um, work with older people and, and school children. And what are the benefits? Well, interestingly, there's not been a great deal of empiric research in this field, but there has been some, and there's certainly an interest in more. Um, it fits with the WHO's active aging framework. Uh, and, and it seems to suggest that there are benefits to mood, sense of self behavior and engagement for older adults. And for children, improvements in perception of aging and potentially reduced antisocial behavior. In Australia, there's been more of an uptake in intergenerational programs, particularly since the airing of the TV series, with the brakes put on because of the pandemic. Um, the majority have involved older people living in aged care facilities. Um, many have not been based on a formal program using educational pedagogy, um, and not all have explicitly monitored um, outcomes of people that are participating, which is probably the ideal. The Griffith University Group have done a great, um, formed a great guideline and toolkit, which is easily accessible on the internet, and it's a great document to look at if people are interested in setting up their own intergenerational initiative. So what was Old People's Home for Four-Year-Olds? Um, I'm sure that some of you watching have seen this TV series. It was aired in 2019 and 2021. And the question was, what happens if we bring two generations together for seven weeks? And will it actually have measurable impacts on health measures that are important for older people. In the first series, we involved 11 older adults who lived in an aged care facility or in a retirement village um, in, the same, um, in the same facility. There were 10 um, preschool students who were all aged four. And there was a purpose-built intergenerational classroom that took place over a period of seven weeks. It was pretty intensive. The class was uh, on for four days a week, from 9 to 3 p.m. And what did we do? Well, we um, the class adhered to the preschool curriculum. We had a fantastic preschool teacher. There was that mix that you have for four-year-olds of structured and unstructured activities. There was some really quite high intensity events that took place as well, including a sports carnival and a concert at the end. So a lot of shared activities. What did we measure? Well, we measured mood in the older people using a screening test, the geriatric depression scale, which is um, a 15 item um, questionnaire. We also looked at muscle strength using the grip strength measure, the dynamometer. And that's because it's a really good measure of muscle strength as we get older and it, and it correlates well with other um, health outcomes. We measured people's balance, uh, how fast they walk uh, and how active people were. And what did we find? Well, the findings were pretty remarkable. Uh, we found that um, three out of four people who initially screened positive for depression on the geriatric depression scale no longer did by the end. In fact, there was an overall reduction of greater than two points on that, on that questionnaire. 80% of the participants increased their grip strength, their gait speed, their step count. In fact, I think it was 90% for their step count, which is impressive. Um, half improved on their balance. And the children's parents reported increased 
confidence is particularly um, speaking up and, and potentially increased empathetic behaviours as well. The second series, which aired earlier this year, flipped things up a little bit. And this time involved older people who were living alone in the community. And they're an amazing group of people. Uh, and um, a similar model, um, again, um, 11 older adults and 10 preschool students. And again, that six to seven week program, a fairly intensive program. And this time we changed some of the things that we wanted to measure as well. So we did a shorter mood screen. We also looked at the older participants' self-reported quality of life. And we also looked at something called frailty, which is a medical concept that is um, a really good predictor of adverse events happening as we get older, such as needing to go to hospital, such as living longer, um, and such as needing to move into an aged care facility. And what did we find? Well, we found for the older adults that there were significant positive changes in the measures of frailty, mood and quality of life. And for children, improvements in pro-social skills and vocabulary. And the question is, why? And there's a comment made by my colleague on the program, Nicola, the physiotherapist, when she said, um, and describing one of the changes in the participants, she said that as a physiotherapist, I could not have got the same results in the same period of time. There's something really special about this interaction and why. And I guess if you've seen the program, you've probably got your own ideas about why. But I think it's because it gives people a real sense of purpose. I focused a lot of my talk on the older people today but I can tell you that the benefits really flow both ways. In fact, I'd suggest they flow three ways because I think that indeed the families that were involved, it meant a lot to the families involved to have that older person in their child's life. But having a sense of purpose is so important to all of us and it gives us a reason to get up. It gives us a reason to get out the door um, and, and gives us something to look forward to. And the older adults were so incredibly helpful for this young group of people. There was real connection there and it was genuine. And I think there's something really lovely about interacting with younger children. It's honest, it's genuine, it's open. We all know that young people may not have a filter. And that's a lovely thing because when they say they like you and they want to be with you, you take that at face value. And I think that that means a lot for your sense of self. It was fun and it was silly. And I think there's no age limit on our need to have fun and silliness. It was challenging in many ways, whether it be meeting a group of strangers or hanging out with a bunch of kids that you haven't done for a while or taking on new physical challenges. And that builds on your own sense of um, of efficacy and purpose. I guess the last thing I'd say is that it, I think there's just a little element that it's magic. There is something quite magic about intergenerational contact. So where to? I think a lot of people were inspired by what they saw uh, in many different ways. And I think there are lots of ways intergenerational opportunities can play out, whether when the pandemic allows us to do so safely arranging visits and I know from my working nursing homes just what a difference it can make when young people come in whether it's setting up visits between older people and school programs volunteer programs sport local communities and the way that you can share wisdom with younger people or reaching out to older and younger people in the street and your neighbors there's probably a need for further research in this field to understand what models provide the most um, value and are the easiest to scale. And finally, brave, because I think that was one of the take homes from the, the show. Sometimes, um, and one of the participants, I loved what she said. She said, you don't grow until you push yourself. And that's a message that she was giving herself in the show, but I think it's a message for all of us. It's one for me as well. Sometimes we've just got to take risks and do new things and try new things, no matter what age we are 
to improve our lives and to um, and to improve our well-being. So, um, well, one last slide is just that one of the really lovely things that happened after the series is that there was a growing interest in intergenerational contact, and so many smart, clever people responded uh, and one example is a, a new intergenerational real life aged care home co-located with the child care has been built and is operational in western new south wales and that's just it's just really amazing so that's all i um wanted to say thank you so much for the opportunity to speak and i'm really looking forward to hearing the rest of the presentations and joining in the panel later Thank you, Stephanie. Um, what a wonderful presentation. How inspiring that is. It really gives you a, a warm feeling, a, a fuzzy feeling inside, and um, it really is the way, way forward. I should mention that we will be having a panel discussion uh, at the end. If you have questions, there's a Q&A function on the bottom of your screen. Please enter your questions there. And uh, Emily Connaughton will be uh, bring all the questions together, and all the speakers will be present for a Q&A at questions and answers at the end. Also, uh, copies of the slides and a copy of the, the whole program on, the, on video uh, will be available. We'll be giving you details at the end of the presentations. And uh, Daniela Kanerik, who does most of the organizing for today, uh, will be sending emails to all of you with those details as well. So it's my pleasure now to welcome Mar Mariella Silveira. Uh, Mariella has worked at Southeast Sydney Local Health District Health Promotion Service for the last 13 years. Well, well done, Mariella, 13 years, that's great, okay. Uh, her experience is working in women's health, equity and health, food security, tobacco control programs, and more recently, the Healthy Active Aging Team. Mariella holds a master's in uh, health education and a degree in public health as well. And that included the research component into depression. And maybe you can guess this from her name about the social determinants of health of women in Spain. So uh, Mariella, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity to participate in this very inspiring forum um, today. First of all, I'd like to um, thank you for the slides. Yes, I'd like to um, um, acknowledge the traditional owners of the land uh, in which we are located today and we work in the Gadigal, Darawal, Bijigal, uh, Wangal, and Wingal uh, peoples, and I'd like to honor. Um, elders uh, past, uh, present past, uh, and the future elders as well. Um, next slide, please. Next one, <laughs> thank you. Okay, so the health promotion statement, I'd like to um, introduce to you um, um, a little bit about what health promotion services strives to do. And health promotion services strives to improve the health and well-being of our community. And how do we aim to do this is uh, by empowering people to have more control over their health and also by working in collaboration to deliver evidence informed uh, programs and also to support clinical services. And if you wanted more information about uh, what our service does for the district, um, you can head to our website there um, uh, as um, uh, stands on the screen. Next slide, please. So I'm presenting today about uh, the Healthy and Active for Life Online program. Uh, this is a very innovative program uh, that started last year, very briefly out, um, um, after the pandemic started. So it's a free 10 week healthy lifestyle and home exercise program for adults, for older adults. Uh, and the aim of the program is really to build the participants fitness, knowledge, skills and confidence to lead active and healthy lives. The program was uh, developed by the Center for Population Health um, Active Aging Team. And of course, it's delivered in partnership um, with all different local health districts across the state. Next slide, please. 
So what are the features of this program, the Healthy and Active for Life Online? Well, first of all, it's free. And that's very important. Um, that is a physical activity and healthy lifestyle program. And it's for individuals living in New South Wales that are 60 years uh, or over. Uh, and for the Aboriginal population, 45 years or over. It runs for 10 weeks, but uh, in these 10 weeks, uh, uh, participants complete each weekly, each week, an online healthy uh, module, healthy lifestyle module. And it, it includes two exercise circuits. Um, we have circuit one that runs over weeks one to five of the program, and circuit two runs in weeks six to 10. And of course, as you may probably uh, imagine, this um, uh, circuits um, uh, increase in difficulty uh, from circuit one to circuit two. So it allows people to adapt uh, to uh, and increase um, the, um, the, the level of exercise that they are doing. Next slide, please. So other features of this program that are very important to participants is that they get an exercise, exercise manual and a log. So this exercise manual and log allows them to view um, the, each of the exercise um, and to actually adequately perform this exercise in a safe manner. They get personalized support. And what it means is that we have um, a group of phone coaches that are um, appropriately trained to ring each participant each week at a convenient time for the participant and spend some time with them over the phone to listen to their questions about the program and answer these questions. The phone coaches are adequately trained and um, in no way they take um, the, the place of a GP or a health professional. And so they're there for the support of each participant. And the program is self-paced. And this means that every module, the participants can take on their own time, learning the information and also uh, performing the exercises and completing the activities of the program. Next slide, please. So the program resources, the participants get in the mail actual physical resources as well. So they have module handouts provided for every session for every week. And they have the exercise manual, of course, as you see on the screen there. And they can also download these resources uh, from the website if they wanted to. Next slide. So what are the eligibility requirements? Um, the eligibility requirements for all participants are that they mustn't be enrolled in any other exercise program, except for walking groups, of course. They should be able to walk independently. And so if they do um, have a need to use a, fr a walking frame, they should only be using this frame um, uh, outdoor. And they are able to do gentle exercise and satisfy a pre-exercise screening questionnaire. And they're able to access HAL online modules and exercise modules. And what this means is that the participants must have a certain amount of um, knowledge of how to use a computer environment or a tablet or a phone. In fact, a lot of our participants do use sometimes only a mobile phone um, or sometimes they have a tablet or a, a laptop or a computer, but they must be able to be um, knowledgeable about how to use that environment. Very basic level of uh, navigation is required. And they're also be, they should be also be able to understand and read English. So uh, a lot of our participants sometimes are from, you know, um, culturally and diverse language backgrounds, but they are able to actually um, read and understand English as well. Next slide, please. So how, are, is it, how can one access this program? Well, it's very easy. Um, if the participant is able to go directly into the website, www.activeandhealthy.newsouthwales.gov.au, they can actually register there. They can also be referred uh, by health professionals, doctors or exercise leaders. Um, and so once the participants register there, they complete an online registration form and they actually go through the pre-exercise screening questionnaire. Now, should any participant answer yes to any of these pre-screening questions, uh, then they will be sent a clearance form 
that they have to go and made um, completed by their GP. And that is to uh, safeguard the participants, uh, especially uh, when they're actually completing the exercise modules that they're able to do these simple exercises. Next screen, please. So um, once the participants are registered and they are cleared by the RGP, if they need to be cleared by the RGP, then they actually um, receive um, an email into their email account and they get a temporary password. And they log into the, uh, the program with this temporary password, and then they're able to change that password to a personal one. And, uh, and then they know they have access to all um, the online modules, the exercise videos, and the weekly handouts. Uh, and a new module becomes available each week, right? But they're not, it, it, the modules, as, as I said before, they can actually do that at their own pace. They had a whole week to actually complete a module at any time they want. Next slide, please. So what's the weekly overview of this program? Very quickly, I'll go through this once because I know I have little time. Uh, so what, what can we expect uh, each week from this Healthy and Active for Life online program? Next slide. Um, so from weeks one to five, as you can see there on the screen, they have an introduction, the, um, the phone coach rings them and says hello, sends a welcome email, and um, they set a time and a day um, for, for, for the participant to receive the call. Then uh, they do some goal setting. Um, week three is healthy plate and serving sizes. Week four, sugar, salt, and fat and label reading. Very important label reading. A lot of people you know, tend to ignore this or not know how to do this label reading. So it's quite an important uh, module, that one. Uh, week five is calcium and vitamin C. And then during week one to five, participants do complete the exercise circuit one which are the very basic level of exercises in the program. Next slide, please. So week six to 10. So there's a fiber and incontinence module, goal setting evaluation, in going back to that second week and an optional session. Now the optional sessions, um, participants can actually complete um, uh, three of these five sessions if they like. And during this weeks six to 10, the participants um, start to complete the circuit two type of exercises. And week 10 is where to next. What does this mean? Uh, week 10 means that you know, the participants then are referred to other community programs um, that they are available in their area. Next slide, please. So the optional sessions, what can participants choose from in these optional sessions? Well, they're very varied and they're very interesting, um, as you can see there on the screen. And um, you know, oral health and vision, recipes and food swaps. That's, you know, one that the participants have um, expressed a lot of interest in. Uh, food safety and shop smart, shop healthy. Um, false prevention, of course, that's uh, quite important too. My age cared, um, uh, talking to the participants about everything that they have to do to access services in, in um, to stay at home, for example. So all these topics or optional sessions are, are very important for participants as well. Next slide, please. The exercise component. Now the exercise component, for example, um, exercise circuit one, and next slide, please. Um, um, they have exercise resources, access to videos. And when we talking about exercises and uh, we, we realize that sometimes, you know, we need a specific instructions on how to complete an exercise in a safe manner. And these videos are amazing. Uh, um, that they actually teach the participants how to do that in a very, very safe manner at home. Um, and they can review these videos as often as they want to review them. Uh, so there's no pressure to, com you know, to complete an exercise quickly as you may have, for example, in a, in a group setting where, you know, if you don't go according to the pace of others, you know, you fall behind and then you become discouraged. So they can review this, you know, as often as they need to. And there's an exercise manual. Uh, so the manual along with the videos uh, can actually help the participants to complete this exercise safely and, uh, and they can feel really fulfilled that they have done this exercise. Next slide, please. 
Then they have an exercise log. And um, a lot of people have said, oh, you know, why do we have an exercise log for this? But, um, you know, actually many participants have expressed uh, a lot of satisfaction with this exercise log because they feel a sense of achievement. Here on the left, as you can see on the screen, you have the different type of exercises that they are given and the different, you know, under seven days of the week. And so every time, you know, the participant completes the exercise for that particular day, they can have, you know, have a tick uh, there, they themselves do it, and they see, you know, how, how far they have gone, you know, uh, through the exercise um, log for that week, and they have that sense of achievement, and they have a sense of improvement as well at times. So participants can complete the exercises during the day or during the week. It doesn't matter when, and they can break up that um, uh, the, the numbers of exercises. Say, for example, they do the first five in the morning and the first five in the afternoon. So it's very flexible, and uh, it adapts to their lifestyle. And we know that um, you know, as, as you know, that people, um, you know, over sixty in this um, uh, a, a stage of life, they have a lot of things sometimes to do. You know, they have families to attend to grandchildren they like to go out with their friends which is good for you know social isolation and social connectedness so this type of programs allows them that flexibility and that's what is why it's so good next slide please so a week 10 or the end of the program what can participants expect when they do get a certificate of completion when they complete the program and the phone coaches are, are there to refer them to any other um, programs in their community. Particularly, we are trying to refer participants to the Get Healthy Coaching and Information Service. And, um, and also they have access to the program for 12 months, uh, including the exercise videos. So this is a continued, the maintenance side of things is, is very good with this program because they can actually continue to do the program 12 months after they have finished it. Um, Next slide, please. So what are the testimonials? I mean, I could have included many more, but um, just um, um, Lynn, for example, here, uh, she expresses there that uh, the program has increased the sense of general wellness and that um, the information is given in an uncomplicated manner, which is quite important um, for all of us, really. Um, and also that the flexibility and balance have improved quite remarkably in her case. Uh, so we have many of these testimonials um, about people who have completed the program in the last 12 months. Next slide, please. So I really thank you for taking the time today and um, we wait for questions um, later on and next slide. And if you want to um, contact me, um, the contact details will be in this presentation that will be uploaded to the, um, the forum website. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Mariella, for a most informative overview of the Healthy and Active for Life online program. It looks like a very valuable resource and an opportunity for older people wanting to improve their health through exercise and lifestyle choices in the ease and comfort of their own homes. Thank you. I'd now like to introduce Professor Henry Bradati, who is a researcher, clinician, policy advisor, and strong advocate for people with dementia and their carers. He's a senior psychogeriatrician in the Older People's Mental Health Service at Prince of Wales in Sydney. And at the University of New South Wales, he is Scientia Professor of Aging and Mental Health, co-director of the Centre for Healthy Brain Aging and director of the Dementia Centre for Research Collaboration. Thank you, Henry. Thank you, Tanya. And thank you, Mariella, as well. So um, it's, uh, Tanya, by the way, is a social worker in the Older People's Mental Health Service. So I'm going to talk about resilience after stress, COVID and mental health. Who remembers this ship? I bet most of you will when I show you the next slide. Yes, it's the Ruby Princess. Cast your mind back to the 20th of March last year and in the following days and months. I did. 
did you, like me, feel at risk? You know, these disembarking passengers infected with COVID, which spread it around New South Wales. Am I going to get this? I tried to find a mask. Everybody was sold out. One pharmacy in Rose Bay was charging $35 for a mask. I couldn't find sanitizer. I had to go to the local brewery to buy some uh, pure alcohol and make my own. If I got sick, would I have a bed in ICU? Would they be rationing by age? And if I needed a ventilator, I'm sure I'd be the last in the queue because I'm older. So these are some of the thoughts that I was having and many of my friends were as well. In fact, some people I know were thinking of buying their own ventilator. In the last two years, we've become experts. AstraZeneca is better than Pfizer, Pfizer is better than AstraZeneca. We, we've become epidemiologists. We know about the R number, bending the curves. We tuned in 11 o'clock every morning for the news conferences, or maybe we didn't. Uh, we knew about emergency measures, lockdowns. We debated whether you should tell on someone who was doing something wrong. We certainly knew what Greater Sydney was and where the hotspots were. And we became very aware of our five kilometer radius and our LGA. But we also became starved for friends and family. We became deprived of children and grandchildren. We became hug hungry. I still can't hug some of my grandchildren. We we're unable to go out to movies, to eat, to go on holidays. We couldn't even go outside our LGA. And we became very careful. We wanted to avoid unnecessary exposure. We didn't shake hands, we didn't kiss, we didn't hug. Around Australia, these are figures from earlier in October, there have been 122,500 cases, over 1,400 deaths, over 30 million tests. Over half the deaths deaths have been in residential aged care. Older people are vulnerable. Who else is vulnerable? People with dementia, because they're more likely to catch the virus. If they do catch it, they're more likely to be sicker. And if they catch the virus and become sick, they're more likely to die. Just living in a residential aged care increases the risk of infection living in close quarters with lots of people. And we remember the, the really high rates of deaths at Newmarch House and Dorothy Henderson Lodge that grabbed all the headlines last year. Thankfully, not this year. We've become a lot better at managing, despite Delta being much more infectious. Other people who are vulnerable are those who lack access to technology, those without family or friends those who can't engage in physical exercise or participate in activities. Imagine you're a person who's frail, living alone, elderly at home, and you can't shop. You can't get help because community health workers weren't able to come into your house. There was a problem with accessing finances. Sometimes there were many people cramped in a very small quarters. There was lack of access to healthcare and to community supports. What we found, and I, I go and visit nursing homes, I'm a clinician as well as a researcher, is in nursing homes, families were not allowed to visit. This was a state regulation, so you could not come. Many patients, particularly those with dementia, people, sorry, residents, became agitated. They were isolated for long periods. In fact, for some of the families, they were coping a lot worse than the residents in the nursing home that they couldn't see their loved one. This picture, by the way, is Maury Barlow, who's a humor therapist we worked with some years ago. And he did a, a, a really good thing. He went and visited nursing homes and did his therapy with residents through a window. He called it window therapy. He engaged them and they started laughing and they were engaging and they were singing. It really worked well, window therapy. Now, it's not just catching COVID, it's what happens afterwards. And I think we've all heard of long COVID. And long COVID can affect us in many different parts of the body. The main symptoms, fatigue, headache, 
being out of breath, loss of smell, abdominal pain, chest pain, and hoarseness. They're the main ones. The other ones, the next lot, delirium, diarrhea, fever, skipped meals, this persistent hacking cough, muscle pains, and headache. Who gets it? Well, if you're older and you're female and you have a higher body mass index, in other words, you're more overweight, then you're at more risk. And if a person has more than five of these symptoms in the first week, they have three and a half times the risk of long COVID. How common is long COVID? Well, in a UK study of over 4,000 people, something like 13% had symptoms lasting 28, over 28 days, 4.5% over eight weeks, and just over 2% for over 12 weeks. So it's quite a lot of people. In New South Wales, there's been a large study, and they followed up 3,000 cases, 80% recovered in a month, almost 5%, 5% still had symptoms at three months. And again, older age and being female were risk factors. This is a picture of a younger woman in San Francisco a year after she had COVID still having symptoms. Uh, the Sachs Institute with their 45 and up study, this is a study of over 267,000 people in New South Wales, which started uh, about 15 years ago. and um, they followed up 60,000 people aged 55 or more. And what they found in this most recent survey is people miss their healthcare appointments. One in six. Half missed a dental appointment, including me, I must confess. Uh, a third missed a GP appointment, usually because it wasn't urgent or because they were worried going to the GP was too, too risky. And this statistic was, I think, really alarming. 9% of women under 75 missed their breast cancer screening and half had still not caught up. That's the real worry. Despite this, 94% reported pretty good quality of life. Even though some were lonely, in fact, 9% were intensely lonely, lonely. And one in three said their mental health had worsened because of the pandemic. So that's 33% versus 10% before COVID. Financial worries were common. And really sadly, 3% were worried about being homeless. So how do older people react to stress? Well, the good news, as Suraj told us, told us, is older people have less anxiety and depression, and they're better at regulating their emotions than younger adults. There was a lot of concern that with this crisis, the mental health of older adults would really suffer badly. But it hasn't been like that. It's been the younger adults who've had more mental health problems. Of course, there are some people who are particular risk in the elderly, those with dementia, those in nursing homes. Other people are family carers. So if you're caring for somebody uh, where you have a double whammy, you have the caring duties plus the the worries about the COVID, uh, you're more at risk for mental health uh, consequences, and people who are disadvantaged or from minority communities. Now, I'm just going to talk to you about stress for a moment. When we get stressed, things happen in our body. Yeah, our blood pressure goes up, our heart rate goes up. Uh, we have this thing called the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal cortic cortical axis. Now, you don't need to go into this, but it just means the brain and the other parts of your body are connected and it results in um, more cortisol being, uh, being pumped out, which is associated with heart disease, diabetes, poorer immune function and poorer cognition. So that's happening physiologically. Emotionally, we become more anxious, more depressed, less happy, but not if we can be resilient and moderate these reactions. And that's what I want to turn to now. So stress response in older adults, um, we're more vulnerable because there's a stronger cortisol response and worse regulation of this axis I told you about. But resilience can moderate this. So what is resilience? Well, it's managing stress. 
So we perceive a stressful situation as a challenge, engage in it, and overcome it. And when, by doing that, we actually grow, we adapt, and we recover. How can we be more resilient? So, in fact, I'm going to skip this slide because we're running a bit late now. Resilient people use more active coping styles to manage adversity. Coping strategies are important for achieving well-being. You know, if you're resilient, you don't put your head in the sand and say it's going to go away. You try and deal with it. You don't withdraw socially, and you don't do things like turn to drugs or alcohol. In fact, the research is showing that older adults were less likely to experience pandemic-related anxiety, depression, and stress. Why? Because they have a reservoir of knowledge and skills that help them to cope with challenges over decades. In fact, it's something we can learn. It's a process. It's not something you're just born with. Several research studies. Older people were less likely to have those psychological consequences or stress-related disorders than younger people. And this was from the United States, the first study, from Spain, the second study, from Canada, the third study, and from the Netherlands, the fourth study, all coming to the same conclusion. Even though in the Netherlands, there was more loneliness in the older people. They coped better. How can we grow resilience? The American Psychological Association has published this article saying there are four core components. And I'm gonna go through these. Connection is the first one. And we've been hearing about this all morning. Prioritize relationships. Connect, empathy, understand people. Join a group, become active. It could be a civic group, a religious group, a local walking group, whatever. Second one. Foster wellness, take care of yourself, take care of your body, sleep, adequate nutrition, adequate hydration, mindfulness, and whatever is your shtick. Is it yoga? Is it prayer? Is it meditation? Is it just keeping a journal? Just thinking about things, reflecting on yourself. I'm going to talk about this regarding wisdom in a moment. And avoid the negative outlets, like I mentioned, alcohol and drugs. Third, Embrace healthy thoughts. Keep things in perspective. Look, COVID will become under control or we'll learn to live with it healthily. We have to identify irrational thoughts, accept change, it's life. A good technique is to visualize what you want rather than what you fear. And think about what you did in the past that worked and what didn't. And the final thing is finding purpose or meaning. We heard that from Stephanie and we heard that from Suraj. Finding purpose is really important. It could be helping others as a volunteer. It could be tackling problems. It could be moving towards your goal. goal um, and oh, maybe even looking at self-discovery. And if things aren't working out, get help. It could be from a friend or a health professional. The Mayo Clinic made it more succinct. Get connected. Learn from experience. Remain hopeful, take care of yourself, and be proactive. I mentioned wisdom. This is a talk we had at the Center of Healthy Brain Aging recently. And Professor Dilip Jesti from uh, San Diego gave us this fantastic talk about wisdom and loneliness and COVID. And there were several elements within wisdom that he has found in his research. But I just want to focus on wisdom and loneliness. One of the elements was pro-social behavior, things like empathy and compassion. And what Dillip showed is that wisdom increases with age, especially compassion. And if we're more compassionate, we're less likely to be lonely. And we're likely to feel more, have an enhanced well feeling of well-being. So let me summarize. The COVID pandemic has changed the world. There's no doubt it has had tragic consequences. The deaths, the financial, the physical, the emotional. As older people are especially vulnerable, yet 
they prove more resilient and have adapted better psychologically than younger adults. Today's theme is social connectedness. And this is one of the several ways we can bolster resilience to deal with adversity. The Older People's Mental Health Service. Um, if you want to find copies of this talk, you go to Google and just put in Older People's Mental Health Service Annual Positive Aging Forum, or you can go to the Center for Healthy Brain Aging, uh, chiba.unsw.edu.au. Thank you. Oops. Thank you. Thank you very much, Henry, for that very informative talk, highlighting how resilience can improve both our physical and our mental health, and also how to become more resilient. I think there's lots of take home messages there for all of us, um, especially about compassion. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks very much, Tanya. And uh, I'd like to introduce our last speaker and the, the, really the star of today's program. Uh, we're very privileged to have Hugh McKay. Uh, Hugh McKay is a social psychologist, researcher, and the author of, I can't believe this, 22 books, 22, um, including The Kindness Revolution. Um, in fact, I, I know that's true because sometimes I email Hugh and I get an email message, he's busy writing, so I have to wait. Uh, Hugh is a fellow of the Australian Psychological Society and has been awarded honorary doctorates by five Australian universities. He was appointed an Officer of the Order of Australia in 2015. Hugh uh, McKay. Thank you very much indeed, Henry, and please don't refer to me as the star of the program. I've been entranced um, by these other presentations, including yours, and I'm, I'm, I'm honoured to be part of this, uh, of this panel. And I want to begin by saying something that may seem so blindingly self-evident that you wonder why I even bother mentioning it, but it's something that flows directly from the things that everyone else has been saying, and that is simply to remind us that we are members of a social species. That is our lot as human beings. There are many other social species on the planet, um, but, but we're one of them, uh, which means that we are hopeless in isolation. We are built to connect. We need each other. We need families. We need communities. We need neighborhoods. We need groups of all kinds because we're human. <laughs> We need those groups, those communities, those connections in order to sustain us and nurture us and to give us that all important sense of belonging, which is so fundamental to the mental and emotional health of a person who belongs to a social species. We are here to create the social harmony that is what allows our species to survive, let alone thrive. Uh, so it's not surprising, is it, that neuroscientists who can now peep into the human brain in ways that psychologists and philosophers could previously only speculate about, they tell us that in the human brain is an identifiable cooperative centre. Of course, you would expect that, wouldn't you, for, for members of a social species. We are hardwired to cooperate. We're hardwired to connect, which means, in effect, we're hardwired for kindness for compassion, for mutual respect, because those are the ways we build social harmony. Those are the ways that allow us to cooperate with each other. So when I say kindness, and that's the main focus of my remarks this morning, what do I mean by kindness? I, I, I can define it very simply. Uh, and my definition springs directly from that proposition that we belong to a social species, because we are members of a social species, our deepest psychological need is the need to belong, the need to be taken seriously, the need to be noticed, the need to be heard, the need to be appreciated, the need to be included. So I would define kindness as anything we do to demonstrate to another person that we take them seriously. Uh, that we do acknowledge and appreciate and, in, and include them. 
Uh, and that an act of kindness, of course, under that definition can be anything from a friendly smile or a wave as you pass someone in the street uh, to giving someone uh, your undivided attention when they need it. In fact, I think I'd say listening is probably one of the most potent of all the acts of kindness we can perform for each other. Because when I listen to you, what I'm saying to you without having to put it into words is, I take you seriously enough as a person to bother listening to you. But if I don't give you attentive, empathic listening, then notice that I'm saying the opposite without having to put it into words. If I don't listen, what I'm saying to you is, sorry, Henry, I don't take you seriously enough to bother listening to you. And would we ever say that? Would you ever say that to a partner or a colleague or a friend or a neighbor or a child? Of course not, it'd be too hurtful, it'd be too offensive. Yet when we withhold the gift of listening, that's the message we're sending. So listening is one of the most potent of these acts of kindness, but it can be anything to inviting someone to share a cup of coffee with you uh, or come home for a meal or offering to help do someone shopping for them, whatever it might be. Kindness is therapeutic. And in fact, I would say that the human capacity, the built in, the innate capacity for kindness that we all have is probably our species most valuable asset, even though we don't always value it, it can easily be swept aside in favor of more ego driven impulses like ambition or competitiveness or acquisitiveness and so on. And of course, the fact that we are hardwired for kindness uh, for cooperation doesn't mean we always do it. It needs to be nurtured. We're hardwired for language too. There's a language center in the brain, but that doesn't mean you're born able to speak the mother tongue. You've got the capacity, but it has to be nurtured in ourselves, in each other, and especially in our children and indeed our grandchildren. But it is a remarkable quality, isn't it? I think of kindness as the purest form of human love. All forms of human love are wonderful, aren't they? Romantic love is energetic and energizing and exciting and familial love is remarkable. Blood is thicker than water and so on. But kindness is this unique form of human love, unique in that it does not involve our emotions. It does not involve affection. Isn't this one of the loveliest things to acknowledge about this species that we belong to, that as humans, we are capable of showing kindness towards people we don't like. We're capable of showing kindness towards people we could never agree with about religion or politics or art or culture or anything, doesn't matter. We can even show kindness, uh, perhaps this is the most remarkable thing of all, towards people we don't even know. You see someone who's in a jam, you reach out and help them because you're human, not because you're a hero, just because you're being true uh, to what Abraham Lincoln described as the better angels of our nature. You don't qualify someone, do you, when you see there? You don't say, now, hang on, I see you need a hand here, but how did you vote in the last election? I want to make sure we're on the same way. Not at all. That's not the human way. Samuel Johnson, 250 years ago, wrote very wisely that kindness is in our power even when fondness is not. And I think that's an important thing to remember. Now, knowing all of that about us as humans, let me ask you just for a moment to reflect on what's been going on in Australia over the last 30 or 40 years. It's been a time of major upheaval in many ways. It's been a time of 28 years of uninterrupted economic growth, I know that. Uh, which, by the way, was the worst possible preparation for dealing with a crisis like the pandemic. That's another issue. Um, but what's been happening to us over the last 30 or 40 years has been a, a, an extraordinary number of social changes which have been reshaping our society in a particular direction. And it's a direction that takes us in the opposite way from our true nature as I've just been describing it. If you look at not just Australia, but around the Western world, the sort of social trends that have been reshaping us have been increasing social fragmentation, increasing the risk of social isolation, eroding 
our social cohesion. Now, we don't have time in this session uh, to talk in detail about those trends, but just let me quickly run through almost as sort of headlines what some of them are. Our shrinking households. Uh, we've reached the point where one in four households now contain just one person. The Bureau of Statistics says we're heading for one household in three. Uh, in other words, the, the solo householder is the fastest growing household type in Australia. That doesn't mean everyone who lives alone is lonely. Uh, many people love living alone and see it as a symbol of freedom and independence, but many people don't like living alone and they've been pitchforked into solo householder status by bereavement or relationship breakdown or some other change in their life circumstances. <clears throat> um, uh, and as Stephanie reminded us, the, the era of the multi-generation household, uh, three, three or more, but especially three generation households, which were very common 100 years ago, have almost disappeared today. That, that's a factor. Another factor is our high rate of relationship breakdown between 35 and 40 percent of contemporary marriages will end in divorce. Our falling birth rate is a factor. Uh, you may wonder why that belongs on this list. But again, as Stephanie has reminded us, and we all know, kids act as a kind of social lubricant. Often if, if you move into a new, uh, a new neighborhood, it's the kids who get to know each other first and then um, social connections develop. Well, we are in Australia currently, with our record low birth rate, relative to total population, we're producing the smallest generation of kids Australia has ever produced. So that social lubricant is in shorter supply than ever. If you've got some little kids in your life, value them. <laughs> A lot of people don't. Uh, we're more mobile than we've ever been. We're moving house on average once every six years, and we're also more mobile in the sense that there's almost universal car ownership, and most people live in drive-in, drive-out suburbs where you wave at your neighbor's car, which is very different from stopping and saying good day on the footpath. A um, couple of other things I'd add to this quick list, busyness. Have you noticed how we've promoted busyness to the status of a kind of social virtue? Uh, you know, we, we, in Australia, we've, it's even changed the way we greet each other. How are you going, Henry? Busy? As though, come on, come on, the switch is only on or off. Are you busy or are you dead? Uh, well, busyness is the great enemy of social cohesion. Oh, the neighbours are having drinks on Friday, are they? Sorry, I'm a bit busy. Uh, don't disturb daddy, he's busy. Well, let's watch out for the hazard of busyness. And let's watch out my final one on this quick list is the information technology revolution. What a paradox that's been. We've discovered particularly through the, power, uh, through the pandemic how valuable it's been to allow us to have this second best form of connection as Suraj reminded us. Um, uh, and, it, and it has promised to connect us like never before, that's true. It's also made it possible for us to stay away from each other like never before. So we have the phenomenon and various speakers have mentioned how the problem of loneliness is greater among younger people than older people, that's true. Uh, in fact, the loneliest group in, in Australian society are the 18 to 25s who also happen to be the heaviest users of social media. So we've now got this curious IT phenomenon of people who are connected but lonely. Well, let, let me stop that lightning visit, uh, that lightning trip through social change and just ponder for a moment the cumulative effect, knowing what we know about the nature of the human species, knowing what we know about what it means to belong to a social species, consider the cumulative effect of the kind of changes that I just rattled off. And pretty obviously, the cumulative effect is more social fragmentation and erosion of social cohesion, the rise of individualism, the me culture, the obsession with identity, identity politics, gender identity, ethnic identity, religious identity, all of which emphasizes difference and division and takes us away from the sense that we are all meant to be cooperatively engaged in this project of building social harmony. So what would happen to a society like ours and many others around the world who've been reshaped in the way I've just described over a 30 or 40 year period in ways that challenge the very essence of our human nature. What would you predict? It'd be very easy to predict. You would predict 
the three epidemics that we are now living with even before the pandemic. Our epidemic of loneliness, 25% of Australian adults pre-pandemic 25% of Australian adults reported feeling lonely for most of every week. Our epidemics of anxiety and depression would have been referred to. Uh, I mean, in our criminal justice system, the worst punishment we can think of for a prisoner is solitary confinement. Well, when herd animals are cut off from the herd, that is a form uh, of punishment. So there's some background to what's happening right now. Along comes 2020 bushfires, and then the pandemic. And what these double, this double whammy of crisis and catastrophe has done is what crises and catastrophes almost always do. Uh, in the beginning, we might give way to fear or panic and behave badly, but almost always what these, what these catastrophes, what these disruptions to our lives do is remind us that we're social creatures. They remind us that we all exist in a shimmering, vibrating web of interconnectedness and interdependency. Almost intuitively, instinctively, when we have a crisis of this kind, we become kinder. We become more attentive to the, the, the vulnerable people in our community, the frail aged people living alone. We're more conscious, because we've all had a little taste of social isolation, we're more conscious of the fact we don't like it and that there are many people in our community, perhaps in our street or in our apartment block, who are at risk of social isolation. Uh, we learned that we had to make sacrifices for the common good. Well, we know that's how a social species should live, but isn't it funny, isn't it a bit sad that we sometimes do need a crisis or a catastrophe either societal or even personal, perhaps a life-threatening illness or some other disruption of relationship breakdown uh, that reminds us of the kind of species we are. Uh, I've already said we learned through the pandemic to rely more heavily on inf information technology, and hasn't that made us impatient uh, for that hug that Henry referred to among the hug hungry? Uh, we all need a daily dose of eye contact. We all need personal interactions. We need to eat well, we need to exercise well, and we need social connectedness. That's the third leg of the stool, as it were. Um, so we've been through a period of relearning some basic core truths that we always knew, but can easily forget about what it means to be human. And so the question is, are we gonna hang on to this? Are we going to internalize these lessons, hang on to them, and generalize from them. Wouldn't it be a bit sad? In fact, wouldn't it be pathetic if we let these lessons go and just slip back into being the way we used to be? In fact, is it too much to hope that not only would the lessons from the pandemic transform our personal sense of the need for connectedness and our responsibility to other people to bring them into webs of connectedness, but what if it started to impact on our national agenda as well? What if, as a society, our culture was transformed in the direction of kindness? What if we turned this crisis into a kindness revolution? Uh, what a difference that would make. Uh, we'd be far more energetic, wouldn't we, um, in our commitment to reconciliation with the peoples of our First Nations? We'd be far more humane in our response to people who've come here perfectly legitimately seeking asylum. We'd be making a far more determined effort to eradicate poverty and homelessness. We'd be taking much better care of our frail elderly. We'd be far more generous to people for whom we can find no work uh, and to compensate them when we can't find work for them. Uh, we'd be far kinder to people who are struggling with mental illness, disabilities, other debilitating conditions. We'd be attacking the growing problem of educational inequality. We could go on with a list, but you can see how just introducing kindness as the criterion against which we're going to judge whether a, an economic policy or a social policy is worth considering 
could be transformative in our political culture. But let's let's move back from the big picture. I have about one minute left. So in that minute, uh, let me bring this right back to our front doors, to our streets, to our neighbourhoods, our own families, our own workplaces, our own schools, wherever we live. If we dare to dream of a kinder, more connected society, more compassionate, more cooperative, more respectful, more inclusive, more egalitarian, less cynical, less violent, more harmonious. And who wouldn't dream of that? If you dream of a better society, I'm sure you're not saying, I wish people wouldn't be so kind to each other. Why don't people just hit each other more often and, and not, not waste so many words? Of course you don't dream that. We have a common, a universal dream of a better society, don't we? And it's all those things I just listed. If you dream of that kind of society, there is a way to start turning the dream into reality. And it's a very individual response. Each of us must live as if it's that kind of society. If enough of us live that way, that's the kind of society it will become. Thank you, Henry. Uh, thank you very much, Hugh. Uh, thank you for your wisdom and your perspective. Uh, you really embody those six elements of wisdom that I, I showed in my slide earlier. Um, we now have a panel discussion. So if the uh, speakers, uh, if they could uh, unmute themselves and uh, show their video so we can, they all can be seen on, on the view. And uh, thanks, Mariella. And uh, Michael, who's been helping with the tech, if you could show us as uh, all six of us rather than in a sort of gallery view rather than a presenter spotlight view, that would be even better. So uh, the first question that we've had and the Q&A, we still have uh, lots of people on, online and we have lots of Q&As coming in. Emily Connaughton from our uh, Older People's Mental Health Service at Prince of Wales has been sort of gathering the questions. And Step Suraj, Certain friends are used to criticism, and when I tell them things I appreciate about them, they say it's it's easier to, to take on negative criticism than for, than to see positives. They they think you're trying to butter them up or something like that. How would you uh, advise them about this, Suresh? Great question. I think that has to do more with the person who's receiving the compliment because they might not feel good about themselves and they might find hard to accept that compliment. Maybe they've grown up with parents who, you know, when they got 95% on a test said, where did the other 5% go? So that's something that you are not going to be able to change. Unfortunately, the only thing that you can do is continue to give those Compliments, but maybe not in an overboard way, something that might be more palatable to them. Well, it, it leads to the second question. We talked about good relationships being good for our mental health, but how can we improve our mental health to actually generate good relationships? That's a great question because our mental health has to come first in fact, before we can have good relationships with others. And the way to do that is to focus on a few key pillars of mental health. So the first is looking after yourself through good sleep is really important for our mental health. Physical activity is really important for our mental health. The third pillar is to focus on doing things that give you a sense of purpose as we've spoken about before. And the final thing is to manage our thinking, whether it is through challenging our negative thoughts, whether it's through mindfulness, whether it's through focusing on the things that we appreciate. There are many ways to do this. Thanks. Uh, Stephanie, could I just add a quick comment oh, please. to what yeah, Sarah yeah, said, which of course I, entirely agree with. I just add one little thought that sometimes it just does involve finding the courage to plunge in and start talking to people. Uh, go and knock on the neighbour's door yeah. and say, actually, I'm feeling a bit down. Can we have a cup of tea together? I mean, I, I think while I agree entirely with what Suraj is saying, I think 
uh, actually getting the relationship moving, making the social contact will make its own contribution to mental health as well. Hey, while, you're, while you're on the screen, you've been talking about kindness, social connectedness, and the social fabric of our society for years. How can we get this into government policy? How can we have a GDP which, which doesn't just look at outputs, but looks at what's happening with the fabric of our society? Yeah. I know I'm an incurable optimist, Henry, uh, but I do have this dream that we are within reach of transforming the political culture. I think there's so much discontent, so much disenchantment. I, mean, I gather that there's a serious move around Australia at the moment in many electorates to try and encourage independent members of parliament to try and break the system we have in our in, inherit, inherited from the so-called mother parliament. Uh, thank you very much, England. Yes. Uh, it's not the way everyone runs their politics, but we have adversarialism built into our political system. And that's antithetical to considerations of kindness and compassion and even fairness. We've won the election. We've got the power. We'll decide what to do. Uh, this is no way to run politics. There's no way to run a parliament or a country. But I think it's in the same way as I suggested, the transformation of our society starts individually in our street, in our neighborhood, in our workplace, et cetera. I think as voters, we have to take this on as well and say, my local member of parliament or the candidates for the next election won't know how I feel about this unless I tell them. Yeah. And if I don't tell them, and if millions of us don't bother to say how we feel about this, then the so-called political class can go on in blithe ignorance, assuming that we're happy with the way it is. Thanks, Jim. Stephanie, um, people love the positive initiative, the intergenerational, the, the videos that you saw. The source. Um, how can more be planned? How can it be part of the residential care program? And what's actually, what organisations are working on this? And somebody's also asked about intellectual disability, uh, whether we could do some intergenerational thing for those as well, if you'd like to comment. Oh, yeah, fantastic question. And I think there's really different ways that you can make it happen. And we saw this actually at the end of 2019, really lovely in that some of the nursing homes that I was visiting for the first time were inspired to welcome local groups of children to come in. So it doesn't need to be anything too fancy. It can be reaching out to schools or to local childcare groups or preschools to, to come and say hello. And, and vice versa, it might be preschools or childcare. It's actually often parents that want this to happen. And there have been some lovely examples of this. Um, and it might be, and some nursing homes already had a program of, you know, once a week having a group come through. Um, Playgroup Australia have a great initiative called Ageless Play, where you can register a playgroup. Parents can register a playgroup to take place in aged care facilities. Now, of course, the pandemic has put the brakes on all of this for a period of time, but that won't be forever. So we've got to see when the opportunities will, will, will open up. And what a great suggestion about intellectual disabilities. I, I think it's absolutely would be great to look at um, intergenerational contact. I think in a variety of ways, and it doesn't necessarily need to be four-year-olds or three-year-olds or two-year-olds either. Teenagers and school-age children have a lot to gain themselves from being with older people. All of those things you mentioned, Henry, wisdom and compassion. When you were talking about that, Henry, I wondered if that was why geriatricians are the happiest doctors of all, because apparently we're the happiest. And I wonder <laughs> if it's because we are, by osmosis, absorbing that wisdom, that compassion, that perspective when we spend a lot of our times with older people. Well, we mentioned osmosis because somebody's asked a question about magic. Could that be an osmosis thought connection? When you are with positive people, they lift you up. I think they do, don't they? And that's a great, that's a great suggestion as to the magic behind the scenes. I'm, I'm sure that people like Suraj and our psychology colleagues have a you know, more scientific way of answering that, but that makes sense to me. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mariella, could uh, physical activity be done in groups? 
That's right. Yes, I, I actually answered that question in the chat, I typed an answer, but um, for the benefit of the forum. But yes, um, the, the, the physical activity in the um, Healthy and Active Online um, for Life program, uh, I guess it's, a, it's an individual program. And the importance of uh, registering as individuals is the fact that we keep people safe by doing that pre-screening questionnaire. And if anybody would answer yes to any of those questions, they need GP clearance. And that is to keep people safe in terms of doing the exercises so that there, there are no injuries um, you know, from the participants. Um, the, the Ministry of Health um, had uh, come up with the Healthy and Active for Life face-to-face -face before the pandemic, and it had to be interrupted. So we, we don't know yet what the ministry is going to, you know, sort of have that Healthy and Active for Life face-to-face, -face, uh, and that would be the Healthy and Active for Life in groups. But at the moment, the online program is only for individuals. Now, there is no reason, and I typed that in the answer, that the person who actually registered wants to share the resources with other people. But I, I guess that uh, in terms of safety, um, we really need to have that pre-screening questionnaire uh, completed. And, uh, and then, you know, the GP has to give a clearance to a person who, who answers yes to any of those questions. And that is to keep people safe so that we are not liable to say, well, I've done this exercise in the HAL online program and I became injured. And, uh, and then the people were not actually registered in the program. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Mariella. So there are two questions for me. Um, some people I work with tell me they are tired of being resilient. In your view, is there a limit to being resilient? I think there's something behind this question. Of course, there's no limit to being resilient. Um, but sometimes you feel you don't have to be the one to carry the burden of the world or your family or whatever on your shoulders. Um, and you could say, look, looking after yourself was part of being resilient. And when to say no. And uh, I, I love this um, phrase from, from Hugh. Busyness is the enemy of social engagement. Yeah. I, I, I suffer with this. <laughs> um, and uh, thankfully, I've, I've got a wife. And if it weren't for her, I probably would be much more less social than, sorry, much less social than I am now. And she provides a balance for me uh, in doing that. So um, it's. Uh, I don't think there's a limit to, busy, to resilience, but there is a limit to what each of us can do. And if you feel you're being overloaded, then it's important to say so, because uh, you don't do the other person any favor by taking on more and more, and in fact, and then not being able to do anything at all. The other question to me was, is it more advantageous in old age to live in a retirement village than on our own? Well, it's horses for courses. You know, I don't think there's a formula that says everybody should live in one particular area, um, or one particular lifestyle. I don't think a life a time village would be for me, but I've had other people um, my age who lived in retirement villages and love it. Uh, they think it's wonderful. So it's, it's really up to the person. Hmm. Now, I got sent a list of questions uh, while Hugh was talking, I just want to see if there are any other questions. And uh, Emily, I don't know if you've sent me another email. Emily's sort of coordinating the questions. But um, th there is a, a very nice comment here, um, which is, how can we give the gift of today, in other words, this forum, to people who have no literacy or computers or English as their first language? And uh, I agree that, that that is a limitation. Um, and that we, uh, we cannot do that further. Um, so here's some more questions. Um, uh, from, I've participated in mentoring programs and this has been very useful to stay connected. Um, so I, I agree with that. I think we're sort of running out of steam here. Um, just want to see if there are any more questions for Hugh. Um, Henry, can I just add a comment yeah, to what you please, were saying yeah. about, about uh, people wondering if you're going to run out of resilience? Yes. I, I think a little, a little comment maybe just uh, adds something to what you said. 
because we are members of a social species, that means we are stuck with a very demanding <laughs> role. Uh, we do have a responsibility to connect. We do have a responsibility to respond to each other's needs, to build social... Very, very demanding stuff being a human. Every day, we need to take time out uh, for some solitude. Uh, you mentioned things mm -hmm. like uh, meditation, mindfulness, prayer, might be reading, might be singing, might be walking alone, but something that allows us to, to recharge the batteries, to replenish the resources we need for this demanding task mm -hmm. of connecting. Yes, uh, I agree 100% you. I, I, I keep, I'm a bike rider and I do it about an hour biding in the morning and it's my time. And, uh, I don't like to have anything to interfere with that. And then I'm right for the rest of the day. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. I'd like to thank all our speakers. And uh, I wonder, uh, Michael, who's running the tech, if you could just uh, show the last, the third last slide of my presentation, if you go back to that. And the next one. So that's not the one. Yeah, so. Um, just wanted to mention again that um, if you want to see the slides, um, you can find them on our website, which is incredibly long. So the easiest way to find it is go to the Older People's Mental Health Service, put that into Google and annual positive aging forums and you'll find it. Um, also, uh, we, some of these talks may be on the Center for Healthy Brain Aging. And we also have a number of um, other presentations through Cheaper. And uh, we will give you a link to that in the uh, email that Daniela will send around. I'd just like to thank uh, all the people of the Older People's Mental Health Service who've been involved in organizing today, and uh, also uh, those in the Center for Healthy Brain Aging. And I think my next slide's not moving. Henry, if we could go to the last slide, that would be good. Of the oh, the last slide, thank you. Thank yeah. You. So, um, yeah, here's my thank you. So first of all, to our speakers, to Michael Still, who, uh, who officially opened it, Hugh McKay, Dr. Suresh Santani, Dr. Stephanie Ward, and Mariella Silvera, uh, the people in the Older People's Mental Health Service, and I particularly single out Daniela Kanerik. Uh, emails at 10 p.m. last night, and 7 a.m. this morning, and that's been the pattern over the last few weeks. And uh, she's done an amazing job in putting this all together. Uh, Tanya Jockelson, who introduced me, Karen Lazarus, Helen McIntosh, Emily for Norton, who managed the questions, Alana Bertels, and Linda Liu. And from Chiba, uh, Heidi Douglas and Laurie Mock, who man managed all the, uh, the slides and the technical side of things, and also the, the PR about the forum. Uh, we couldn't have done it without them. The support from Southeast Sydney Local Health District, Angela Caruz and Mike Gatsy, and from Population Health at Southeast Sydney, Dr. Marianne Gale. Thank you to AD Media, Media Sarita Gold, and Michael Sachs, who's been the person behind uh, the screen. And thank you to your, our audience. Now, remember, there's going to be an online survey. Please complete it, because we want to know what you thought of today, what are your thoughts for next year, our 21st year? Um, what you'd like in our survey, uh, in, in our forums. Hopefully we can do it in person. We've missed not being with you and being physically socially connected, not just virtually. Uh, it's just going on to 12 o'clock. Um, there's a QR code that's on your screen. You can just take a picture of that and fill in the survey that way. Or you should go to the website at the bottom uh, form.jotform.com slash OPMHS, Older People's Mental Health Service, slash connect, um, or do it once we send you the email. So uh, for that, we'll close the forum and thank you all for your contributions.